Psalm 19 to the choir master, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Here ends the psalm. Good evening. My name is Ronnie. Uh, welcome uh, to Redemption Hill. Um, today, uh, for the Sola Scriptura uh, Fellowship, we thank you all for making it here today. Um, we are still expecting a few more to come by. Um, they might be a little late, but uh, please accommodate them as they come in. I would like to first acknowledge um, Pastor Michael um, for uh, spearheading this this event today. Uh, he has taken a lot of effort and time in spite of his busy schedule. And uh, as you can see the handouts, there's been a lot of time and effort put to it. Unfortunately, it wasn't up to his satisfaction. He's a perfectionist, but but I, I hope you would forgive me for that. But even then, he's done a fantastic job. Uh, I would like to thank his family uh, for all the support, for allowing us to use this uh, home as we gather here every Sunday. A special mention to the ushers for all who helped uh, making this event happen today. Uh, I'd like to uh, also mention Benji. Benjamin here, who will be, who'll be leading us with the music today. Um, thank you, Benji. Uh, there is a notable absentee here, pastor's wife, Sinu. There was a death in the family, and unfortunately she couldn't make it. I would request you all to pray for her and her family. Why? Because those who forget their history are doomed to repeat it. No brothers and sisters, the Reformation has not ended. Historically, the Reformation was a movement aimed at reforming the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church still remains entirely unreformed. Theologically, the Reformation was an unashamed pursuit of God as he is revealed in his word. While the former has far less impact on most of us today, the latter is central to the sanctifying work of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So one might say that the Reformation has not ended either historically or theologically. Therefore, 
Redemption Hill Church welcomes you to an event that celebrates the theology of the Protestant Reformation. The motto of the Reformation was post tenebas lux, out of darkness, light. The, reform the reformers understood that such blessed truth can be found, believed, and trusted in the pages of scripture alone. As a part of this event, we'll be screening a documentary by Les Lanfear, that's his name. Uh, as Les describes it, when a generation finds the theology and the practice of the modern church wanting, they, th they turn to the internet for answers. An investigation into the roots and reformation reveals a theology that challenges everything that they knew about Christianity with a fresh view of God. Where do they go from here? Now that's a real question. Not if we know about the reformation, but do we know what Bible teaches about God? May God use this film to inform our minds and renew our hearts. So please enjoy the movie and I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions after that. You'll be happy to answer them. Uh, there would be some handouts given to you where you can put your questions and uh, the ushers will be collecting it from you. I would also like to mention a few things. Uh, please use the pens that we have given uh, because to avoid it smudging if you're carrying any other ink pens. I would also like to uh, mention that um, we have washrooms located in the first room on the, on the left, or rather your left, yes, and straight down. If you need any assistance, please ask the ushers. I would request you all to keep your phones on silent. Um, it's a good time to see if your phone is actually on silent. If you need any assistance, please get in touch with the ushers with the black lanyards. We have uh, placed these handouts at the beginning. If anyone has not received it, please raise your hands. We can ensure you have a copy. Has everybody received a copy? In addition to this, if there are any new visitors here today, we would request you to use this. At the end you would find a tearaway section. Mine is already told. And if you can hand it over to the ushers, we can, we will get back to you. We will reach, we reach out to you and please put in as much as information as possible so that we can pray for you as well. Thank you. I would li next like to invite Ashok uh, for the opening prayer. Thank you. Father, we come before you, an assembly of saints. We come before you, O Lord, expecting from you, O Lord. We want you to work in our midst. We want your Holy Spirit to move in our midst, O Lord. We want our minds to be informed by your truth and our hearts to be reformed by your truth, O Lord. As we come together, we pray, O Lord, we do not come with any inherent might in us, O Lord, and no talent in us, O oh Lord, that would make us worthy to come before your throne. But, O oh Lord, we come before you with broken, contrite hearts. And we are covered by the precious righteousness of Christ Jesus, which justifies us in front of your sight, O oh Lord. And we, when we come together, O oh Lord, we pray, work in our midst, O oh Lord Jesus. May your Holy Spirit work in us, lead us and guide us through your truth. And may he work in us, O oh Lord. We pray, O Lord Jesus, that you would bless us through the watching of the movie, O Lord, that you would use all the information in it, O Father, for our benefit, for the building of the church. You would use the hymns, O Lord, that when we sing out unto you, O Lord, your truth and your praises, O Father, that you would bless us through it, O Lord, and may much glory be brought to your name. Through the question and, question and answer session, O Lord, we pray, O Lord, again, that you would inform our hearts and our minds, O Lord, that we would learn much about your truth and we would be changed by it. Through the fellowship with the saints, we pray, O Lord, when we spend time with one another, that you would use it for our mutual building and edification of the church. 
and Father above everything, O Lord. When Pastor Michael takes your holy word and preaches it, O Father, faithfully, O Lord, we pray that you would use the words of the scripture for the building of your church. Father, we pray, O Lord, all glory and all honor be unto your name. We bless you from, a, from the depth of our hearts. In Jesus' precious and mighty name, we pray. I want to start by uh, welcoming each and every one of you here. It's a great delight to see so many people come. As you know, we are a small house church and it's always a joy to see our rooms filled with people. So I want to thank you all for taking the time to come. Um, I have a very difficult task laid before me this evening. I have 30 minutes to share with you a message that probably is the most important message that you could hear in your life. And I don't say that lightly. Let's take a pause for a moment before we begin so that the weight of this moment may sink in for all of us. You see, the thing is, no matter how well I word myself in this message, or any message for that matter, and no matter how hard you strain to hear, analyze in scripture, and believe, none of it is going to matter unless the Holy Spirit works in our hearts. We need Him desperately at this moment and believe you me, I need Him more than you do at this moment. The difficulty of my task in these 30 minutes is not the difficulty that comes from having to mash all that I want to say in 30 minutes. Neither is it the difficulty that I have in having to word myself accurately. These things are important. They are difficult, but, but that's not the difficulty that I'm talking about. The difficulty that I'm talking about is the burden in my own heart a prayer that oh that we may believe the word of God oh that we may not leave this place today the same that you would see the word of God for what it means to us as believers it means everything and that's my task and no matter how I say it, and no matter how you hear it, unless the Spirit of our God works, all of this is in vain. So will you bow your heads with me as I pray? Pray for me and pray for each and every one of us that the Word of God may be expounded and that we may hear the voice of of our shepherd and as his sheep may we respond O oh Lord convict your people that they might delight in your word be held captive to your word and be transformed by it every day of their lives Lord I pray the prayer Peter prayed Grant your born servant boldness to speak your truth with all clarity 
and honesty and that your spirit would descend upon this place and work mighty miracles in our midst amen my job today is to show you the excellence of god's word now i know that we've spent quite a bit of time watching a documentary i'm sure that we've been engaged in some discussions following that documentary and i'm sure that some of you have put in questions but here's what i want to say off the bat i'm not here to preach calvinism i'm here to preach something far more important so before i do that i have to put the documentary in its place to say why exactly did we show the documentary one because we wanted to show the historical events of the reformation and the reason why we have our churches today each one of us carries a bible in our own hands able and capable of speaking about it having opinions about it preaching it and we have this in our hands because men have given their lives for you to hold it and it does us well to remember these men and it does us well to remember the events of the reformation that has made this day possible for each one of us to come but there's a far more important reason why we picked this particular documentary in one month brothers and sisters this world will celebrate christmas christmas trees will go up christmas lights will decorate houses cities nations children will go on carol rounds and the messages that you hear on tv and all around will be on christmas the news will be about christmas but here's the thing brothers and sisters a lot of these people who are going to hear the things these christmas it will be their last month for many people december is probably the last month of their lives on earth and here's something that you and i take for granted none of us believe it is us none of us believe for a moment that this december will be our last but for many people it will be maybe even for some in this room are you ready to meet your savior are you ready to go before him holding the truth of this scripture and say i have understood it what will he tell you when you meet him matthew 7:21 says that many on that day when the lord shall return shall say lord lord did we not do mighty miracles in your name did we not cast out demons in your name and the lord will tell them depart from me i never knew you which will you be do you cast out demons in his name do you do mighty miracles in his name even they when they stand before god he will tell them i never knew you why you workers of lawlessness you who thought that there is no truth to which you must conform as christians as believers in christ so this christmas people will begin to say yes it's about jesus but what do they mean when they say it's about jesus because if they believe the historical events of Christ's coming and his death or even his resurrection it won't save them 
Because brothers and sisters, it is not history that saves you. It's theology. It is not the events of history that save you, but it is in believing the word of God and what those historical events communicate. We, most of us, I'm guessing in this room, would identify ourselves as protestant. And everything you heard in that documentary is the theology of the men who created for you the protestant movement. And so our focus this evening is not so much on the historical events of the Reformation. I don't care if we believe it happened or not, brothers, if we do not believe in the theology of the Reformation. Most of us find that word a very difficult word to digest. In fact, you hear it resound in a lot of churches when they tell you, let's not talk about theology, let's just talk about faith. Let's not talk about these things that divide, let's talk about faith. But here is the interesting thing, brothers and sisters. Theology, by definition, means the study of the nature and the character of God. Are you telling me that we should put aside the pursuit of the understanding of the person of God? No, we must not. We have come to hate these words that were heralded, that were most precious truths in the time of the Reformation. And we want you to see that. I want you to see that you can pick up God's word and it is most delightful and beautiful. So I'm going to take all these that you have heard and bring it down to a single point that I want to tell you. I have nothing complex for you today. I have a very simple thing I want to communicate to you. Sola Scriptura. Scripture alone. It was the root of the Protestant Reformation. Calvinism was not the root of the Protestant Reformation. It didn't happen because a bunch of guys came together and made five points. If you seep down into the depths of this reformation, you will find one thing that happened that caused a flow of things to happen. And it is famously, as you've seen, Martin Luther nailing 95 theses onto his church door. But where did those theses come from? Those theses came from a man who had one job to do. It was to teach the Bible. And the more he read it, and the more he drowned himself inside of it, he began to understand that all that he was seeing in cultural Christianity outside of him was false. And he had two choices. Go with the world, or the so-called Christian church, or go into God's word. And that's the only thing I want to leave with you today. That the scripture alone is the foundation for all Christian faith and practice. Nothing else. Nothing else. Not thought, not human wisdom, not pastors, not preachers, not councils, not churches, not confessional statements, not any of these things, not even gifts, not even visions, not even prophecy. None of these things form the foundation of Christian faith and practice. The word does. And if that's all you hear from me today, and that's all you take back, that's all I want you to take back. Because what you see as the theology of the reformers came out from such a devotion to the Bible. It doesn't matter if you believe the five points of Calvinism or not. It doesn't matter at all if you will not believe God's word to be God's word. So I have two verses to focus on. One 2 Timothy 3.16 and 2 Ephesians 2.8. 
It might be difficult for you to turn. So just hear me. We'll make sure we get these things to you, all of these resources to you in the course of the weeks. We, we will ensure we answer all your questions that you put out in the course of the week. But listen to me, brothers. Here's two things that you and I completely agree upon. One, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed. And it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We're all in agreement. Yes? Amen. And the second is Ephesians 2, 8. That we have been saved by grace through faith. And this is not our own doing. It is the gift of God. Amen? We have two things that we agree upon. That the Bible is breathed out by God. The scripture is breathed out by God. And two... Our faith is not based on works. Our faith is by grace through faith alone. And we have nothing to boast in these two things. But here's the problem. Every one of us will agree that the Bible needs to be exalted. But how much should the Bible be exalted? Every one of us will agree that faith is the foundational cornerstone of our Christian belief in everything that we do. But what is our faith subject to? What is our faith based upon? Of course, we'll say the Bible. But what do we mean when we say the Bible? And so for a moment, I'm going to Hebrews 11, 1 to 3, and I'm sure all of you know this verse. So I'm going to read it out once. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. We know that verse. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So let's take faith for a moment that we all agree upon is the cornerstone of our Christian belief. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. So you're hoping for something. And you have assurance of what you're hoping for. This is not like you attending an interview and coming back and saying, I hope I get it. It's not the faith described in the Bible. In the Bible, faith is assurance. I'm hoping for this thing and I know it's going to come. And second, it is the conviction of things not seen. I am saved. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and I am His. It's a conviction. I don't, I don't see it. I didn't see God appear before me, take out my heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. I didn't have a witness next to me looking at this process happening. But I'm convicted. I know and the example here cited by the author of Hebrews is this. For by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. It's an interesting thought. We believe that the universe was created by the word of his mouth. Why do we believe that? Scientific reason? Philosophical argumentation? Do we try to convince people? The author of Hebrews here says it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who opposes. It doesn't matter what ideas people come up with. The reason I believe that the world was created by the word of God is because I have faith. And it is in faith I believe these things. So brothers and sisters, everything that you believe in the Christian belief and in the Christian walk is produced from faith. And faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence or the conviction of things not seen. So here's the interesting thing and this is what I want you to see. How did God create the world? 
by the word of his mouth god created the world with the word of god how do you know this vision prophecy dream in holy scripture and what you have here is that the word of god does something in our hearts to produce this thing called faith because remember that romans 10:17 tells you how you can have faith faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of christ alone so you have this extremely intertwined faith and word that your faith is produced only by the word of god and this faith that is produced by this word of god causes you to what believe in the word of god and it's an amazing truth we have faith because his word produces faith in us and the more faith that it produces the more we believe in his word and the more we believe in his word the more faith it produces and the more faith it produces the more we believe in his word now here's the thing brothers and sisters faith here is the subjective element you change the word and you put the muslim quran you'll still have faith but faith produced by false theology a false understanding of god you remove that and you put atheism you'll have faith because you got to believe that everything came from nothing but your faith is produced by what it's based on brothers and sisters if you get theology wrong you get faith wrong and if you stand before the god of this universe the test of your faith is based on if it was founded upon his word it doesn't matter if you can claim mighty things according to matthew 7:21 it matters if your faith is founded upon the word one of the struggles most people has when it comes to the word is this somehow we have a feeling that the more we elevate god's word at least in our culture this is predominantly there somehow we have a feeling if we elevate the word more we somehow reduce god that if we keep saying scripture 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 that somehow we are binding god within the pages of this book and we say god can't fit this book and so we have a practical theology that often times will not conform to this statement when we say that the bible is the sure foundation of all christian faith and practice here's what i want you to see in isaiah 55:11 this is what god the father proclaims so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth it shall not return to me empty but it shall accomplish that which i purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which i sent it when the scripture says that the word of god is god breathed it shows you the sense of intimacy with the word and with god it's breath you go close to a person you feel the breath of his speech and so is the word of god it is the very god breathed truth the question is this can there ever be a possibility that god can lie no can there ever be a possibility that god will go against his own word no you see you can't separate the person of the father god the father from his word you just can't 
because these words are not lies but they are words that are breathed out by God himself it is that very breath of God that's given you life and given me life in Matthew 22 there's this interesting thing that happens when the Sadducees come to Jesus and the Pharisees, Sadducees come to Jesus and they're always after him asking one question or another trying to corner him and one of the questions is about the resurrection. They don't believe the resurrection. And so they ask him, if a woman is married to a man and her husband dies, she marries another man and, his, and she, he dies and he, she marries again and he dies when she goes to heaven, whose wife will she be? As if they cornered Christ in that moment. Right? Here's the interesting thing. They don't believe in the resurrection. Here is Christ's argument for the resurrection. He says, for the resurrection of the dead, verse 31, Matthew 22, have you not read what was said to you by God? Now it's interesting. God never said to you. God was actually talking to Moses. But somehow Jesus here implies that what God told Moses is what God's telling you. So what God's written down in his word as he speaks to Moses is what God's telling you. And here's what he said. I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished by at his teaching. So his whole argument for why there is resurrection is God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And Abraham, Isaac and Jacob at that point are already dead. And God's not the God of the dead, but of the living. He should have said, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's not what he said. I am the God. Brothers and sisters, Jesus defends the resurrection and eternal life based on the tense of a verb in the Old Testament. That shows you how much He trusted God's word. His whole argument is based on the tense of a verb. You can't separate the father from the words that he has spoken. Let's take the son. For we believe in a triune God. Can Jesus be separated from the word? In John 1.1, we have the apostle John saying, In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he calls Jesus the very incarnate word of God he is the very word you can't separate the word from Jesus you lose the word you lose him most of us don't have this struggle when it comes to the father and the son but when it comes to the spirit it gets a little jittery because in our culture the spirit of God is seen as some manifestable force that we can somehow touch feel and do things through and so the more the word of God is elevated, oftentimes you hear people say, you need to reduce down on the preaching and maybe focus a little bit more on the worship session. Why? So that the spirit moves. And you find Jesus in John chapter 14 promising to us that the helper will come. In John 16, sorry. That the helper will will indeed come 14 and I think 16 also 14 verse 15 if you love me you will keep my commandments and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever even the spirit of truth and he goes on in John chapter 16 to say but when the helper comes he will guide you into all truth bringing to your remembrance all that I have spoken so brothers and sisters we make great error 
when we take the word of god and we think of it as some kind of information manual i want to impress upon your heart this thought we believe that god is infinite do we not but here's the interesting thing about that statement do you know what infinite actually means you see it's just a word we coined for the horizon we cannot see it's just a word we coined for to say endless but we don't know infinity we don't understand it it's a concept so far off we use a word to say that and if god is infinite how can you and i as finite people actually know him how can we grasp this god and the truth is we cannot unless he makes himself known and he did how through the word of his mouth this scripture is god's revelation to you about who he is and if we will not drown ourselves in this word we won't believe let me bring it to a close by pointing your attention to galatians 1 in galatians 1 in all the letters that paul writes to the churches he always starts by saying i thank god for you for the love that you have and the faith that you have to the corinthian church which was a church so broken he said i thank god for the knowledge that you have because love and grace is a bit iffy in your case but yes knowledge you have good knowledge but there's one church where he doesn't begin that way and it's the galatian church and he begins this way oh you foolish galatians why how can you so quickly desert the gospel of jesus christ for another gospel why are they doing that because there are some in you who want to distort the truth and so you're being taken away by it and here's what paul says if i the apostles or an angel from heaven came to you and taught to you a gospel contrary to the one that i gave or that we gave in scripture he is to be accursed i want you to understand something do you know what that means it means this suppose i open my bible and the so called calvinistic theology explodes before me and i believe it and paul appears and says you got it wrong that's not what i meant paul saying i should not listen to him I am captive to this that if an angel imagine the picture brothers and sisters if an angel were to appear a celestial being from heaven were to come and teach you something contrary to scripture and contrary to scripture how you understand from the scripture by the power of the holy spirit what is being taught and if paul the apostle stood here i would have to stand here and tell him paul i disagree with you because as much as you wrote the book of romans the holy spirit wrote it for me we have to trust the bible not preachers not teachers but the word of god and i want to encourage you brothers and sisters that if we will not pick up god's word and really understand who our god is then does not matter what we do if at the end of all this we stand before our king and he does not recognize us 
You want to know Jesus? Don't pray for visions. Visions are good. Don't pray for supernatural revelation. Of course that is good. But you are called to take even those and test every spirit, Paul says, against the founded truth of God's word. We have one thing that remains to us and it is what I started with. Sola Scriptura. It means everything to us. And if we disagree with one another, may we disagree on the basis of the word and not the basis of our experiences or our thoughts. Let our hearts and our minds be captive to scripture and may scripture inform our minds and reform our hearts. Let us pray. Heavenly gracious Father, we come before you we lay all of these things at your feet all that we've heard and all that we saw in your word to say this much we love you Jesus we love you for how you've revealed yourself in your word not for who we think you are but for who we believe you are because the Holy Spirit has worked faith into our hearts by the hearing of the word of God. And may this faith so resound that we will trust your word more and in trusting your word more that we would grow from one degree of faith to another. Bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. We want to, uh, we may not be able to go through all the questions, but we will, we, uh, so do visit our site, redemptionhill.in. Uh, we will be uh, putting out more and more resources. We are very committed as a church to put out uh, gospel-centered resources. So, in fact, if you've got more questions, if you keep writing, it'll be a great help for us because we will be able to speak about that, write articles about that, uh, you know, put pod podcasts for that. So, uh, encouraging all of you to do that. But, uh, yeah. So, Ashok uh, serves with me in the church. So, we both handle the word of God at church. And so, um, he'll lead the Q&A. And I'll, I'll more be a support. So, so I have... Uh Three questions, <laughs> which uh, I think are a bit more relevant and uh, in context of our current topic that we're discussing as well. So I'll be reading out the questions, and uh, I and Pastor Michael will be going taking rounds with them. So yeah. shall I start? Yeah. You can start with the word of prayer. Yes, we can start with the word. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. O oh Lord, we trust in your ways, we trust in your statutes and your commandments. We trust in the holy work of your Holy Spirit. So we pray, O oh Lord, as we sit together and discuss these questions, as we look into your scriptures, we pray, O oh Lord, may it not be a mere intellectual effort, but rather, O oh Lord, may your Holy Spirit use whatever that is spoken and discussed for our edification, for the building of church, O oh Lord, and help us all be uh, help us all to be blessed by it, O Lord Jesus, and give us wisdom, O Lord, that we uh, trust solely on the scriptures for answering the questions, and uh, O Lord, bless this time. In Jesus' precious and mighty name we pray. Amen, 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 amen. So the first question is this. If God has predestined us, chosen us, then what about the rest of the people? If God has predestined or chosen us, then what about the rest of the people? So I'm assuming the uh, the uh, context here is this. So what happens to the rest of the people? God has only chosen a few, predestined a few. Well, there is a simple answer, but then I'll be uh, kind of taken out as ruthless if I put it that way. But then if we go into the scriptures, 
So let me put it this way. What is the question actually? So what happens to the rest of the people? Are they going to hell? Will they perish? So what if they really tried and wanted to know God? And wouldn't it be unfair because they were not chosen in the first place? So I'm guessing these are the implications of the question uh, from what it could mean about the rest of the people. So I'd like to go at it this way, this, uh, this various different angles that you can go about it. Uh, but here's what we know from the scripture. God has predestined people. Romans 8, 29, 30 uh, bears with, uh, uh, testifies this, that God has chosen people, God has people, called people, God has predestined people for uh, sanctification, for uh, justification and for glorification. And we know that God has chosen a chosen few, that uh, God has made vessels of uh, destruction as well as vessels for good purpose uh, from Romans 9. So I think Romans 9 answers that as well. As there is, as much as there is people, uh, people called by God for good purposes, for the glory of God, there are also people who will not know this God. So the, uh, the, the thing that comes up there is this, wouldn't it be unfair that there's a bunch of people who are going to hell? Wouldn't it be unfair that if God hasn't chosen people, that they will be eternally punished? It is unfair that there are people going to hell. That's what is unfair. All of us are born in sin, conceived in sin, in sin my, I was conceived in womb, uh, Psalm 55 3. It says that you were conceived in the womb with much sin and there was only one trajectory for us in the first place and that is in the depths of hell to eternally die, to eternally burn in the lake of fire. But here is a God who in his mercy, when he has no need to do this, he in no way is indebted to any human being on the earth who has no contract whatsoever, who is not moved by uh, your elegance or the way we speak or our uh, gifts or our uh, uh, anything that we have inherently. But yet here is a God who comes and says, I know these are such a people, but in spite of your lack of love, in spite of your disobedience, here I am going to show my glory by cho choosing for myself a people who I will be destined the heavens. So as much as we look into it and say it is unfair, it is true, it is unfair that God would actually save people. It is true that it is unfair that God's beloved son has to come down upon the earth and bear upon the sins of these people, these people referring to us, people like us who have believed in Christ Jesus, that there would be any reason that Christ Jesus will have to bear our sins upon the cross. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I think uh, the... Uh, for me, it's always been this, the, the argument that usually comes from that question is uh, fairness and justice. Um, we tend to say, what about those people who are not predestined? Is it, isn't it unfair that they end up in hell? And it's a legitimate question. I think it's a very legitimate question. Here's the problem though. The question is not if it is unfair. The question is, is it just? Here's how I resolve that tension. Uh, you have a child um, who wants to have chocolates. And he's screaming and he's saying, I want chocolates. And I'm sure all of you know that experience. He's screaming, I want chocolates. And you say, no, it's bad for you. You can't have it right now. You can't have ice cream right now because you're having a cold. You can't have it. Does the child ever look at you and say, this is unjust? Or does the child say, this is unfair? Um, the child says it's unfair whereas if you have a situation where there is a rape that happens and the criminal grows free and the ju justice system does nothing ab about it and the and the government does nothing about it we raise our slogans and do we say is it not it's not fair no we say it's not just you see fairness holds the standard of that justice on my perspective. I can say it's not fair from my perspective. It's not fair, Lord. It's not fair. And it doesn't matter how long I say it because my fairness does not determine justice. But can I look at God and say, is it not just? This that you do is not just. 
And the reason we can't say that, brothers and sisters, is because justice works for us differently than it works for God. You see, we are bound by justice. He's not bound by justice. Everything he does is just. He is the definition of justice. If we had a world where God was ultimately cruel, that cruelty would be justice. Because he is the very definition of justice. He is not bound by principles. Principles are bound to him. So when we come to these kind of honestly difficult texts in scripture, we have two options to go about it. I can't possibly believe in such a God is not a statement we can say. I will believe in a God as he describes himself to be. And this is a tension we have to face in scripture. So simple answer, what about those who are not predestined? Those who are not predestined continue to hate God all their lives and end up in hell. We who were predestined were saved through grace to turn around to repentance and believe in Him. And so the question as Ashok was putting it is not why aren't you saving everybody? The actual question is why are you even saving a few? Because when we read from Genesis to Revelation a God who made this universe has no reason I always say that you, you bake a cake, you get it, you know, the cake, uh, a thief comes, you know, a thief comes and, you know, shows you a gun and says, give me your cake. How many of you are going to say, no? You, you'd say, take it all, I'd bake you a few more. Just don't hurt me. God can do that. And so people tend to think God is unloving when you see him in this light of predestination. But here's the thing. God could have thrown everybody out. But he stands in the middle and gets stabbed for you and me. So the love of God is not lessened by the doctrine of predestination. It is heightened. A brother once asked me, (coughs) the Bible says God was sorry that he created man. See, God made a mistake. I said, you can take it two ways. You can take it out of its context and you can say, yeah, God made a mistake and he was sorry he created man. Or you can say, God knew he was going to be sorry that he created you for the kind of sins you will do and what he will have to do to save you and yet he created you. Which defines a greater God? A God who did it out of love. So, those whom he calls... He will save. Yes. Inevitably bring them. Why? Uh, one, one answer would be because as believers your heart is captive to the word of God and the word of God commands it. Go. But the second thing is uh, we tend to think God predestines or we tend to think God sovereignly ordains is the word only the ends but we tend to fail to see that God also ordains the means so what do I mean let's say that there are a few people whom God predestines to be saved what's his sovereign ordaining will as their end is that they will end up in heaven but he also ordains how they will end up in heaven how will they end up in heaven through the preaching of the word Who will preach the word? We will preach the word. That's why Paul says, how can people believe if they have not heard? And how can they hear if no one has preached? And how can they preach if no one has sent? That God's not sovereignly just ordaining, but it's it's, it's actually reverse. Interestingly, Calvinism tends to, in our minds we think it affects evangelism. But most of the greatest evangelists in the world have been Calvinists. If you throw out words of great evangelists, most of them would be Calvinistic. Why do they do that? I use the example of always a man named John G. Payton. Payton was a, uh, was a missionary who decided to go among the cannibals in what is now the New Hebrides Islands. He, he wanted to go among the cannibals and people would not send him because it's dangerous. You're going to die because missionaries have died going there. Even an elder of his church said... Uh, do you want to go and be eaten by men? And he, and he looked at this elderly gentleman in his church and he said, 
Mr. You are very old of age and your own prospect is to be laid in the grave and eaten by worms. Whether eaten by men or eaten by worms, I'd rather be eaten for the glory of God. And he goes, takes his wife and two-year-old daughter. Four months in, I think, daughter catches fever, daughter dies. He buries the daughter. Four months later, the wife catches fever, the wife dies. He buries the wife next to the daughter. Sometime later, he catches the fever. He nearly dies, but is spared. But he continues his ministry. Today, those islands are 99% Christian because of the price this man paid. Why did he pay it as a Calvinist? Because he understood God wants to save them and his elect could be there and he's willing to lay down his life trusting that God would use it one way or another to save them and whether it be to be eaten by worms or by men, he wanted to do it for the glory of God. So the reverse is true actually. When you evangelize, you're not then bothered about getting people to believe because you know that's the work of the Holy Spirit. You're only bothered about being the means that God uses and it strengthens you. How many times have you had those scenarios where you wish that if you'd shared the gospel to this person who died at this point of time, maybe some things could have happened. But here's the thing, the doctrine of election is you may fail, God won't fail. So the thing is, there is no human soul that will slip from your hands and end up in hell because it's not your hands to begin with it's God's hand so we preach because he calls us to preach and we preach because it's what God ordains us to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, even concerning that I think uh, when there are people in Nineveh who have to be saved and uh, God not only uh, says that I have people among Nineveh who needs to be saved he also ordains the means for it he calls out the uh, Jonah. Jonah and he sends him there and Jonah tries to resist it but nevertheless he has to spend three days inside the uh, belly of a sh- uh, pig and he has to be spit out <laughs> in Nineveh. So here we have a God who it's it's not as though there's someone predestined, he turns and he comes to God. It is such that God has predestined someone, he'll make sure that the person is saved, he calls the people, he gives them burden to reach out to that person and he carries out the entire yeah. plan. And, and, the, and the message that Jonah gave was a message of destruction. He came there to say, God's going to pour out wrath, and they repented. Right? So, um, yeah. We can do one more question. I think we are running short of time. Uh, that was the second question, actually. Why okay. would we pray? <laughs> okay. Pray. Yeah. Uh, anyone who calls out to the name of the Lord will be saved. Hence, what do we do with it? So, uh, what, if, what if the non elect, I'm guessing the point is that what if the non elect are to cry out in the name of the Lord. Uh, yeah. I think we just covered this uh, particular verse right now. It's, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? Haven't we uh, cast out demons in your name? So scripture itself in a very direct and plain manner bears witness to this that not everybody who calls out to the name of the Lord just like that are getting saved. So if it is, it's, 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 there, is a, there is more than a plain, let's p- uh, put it this way. When we read Bible, we do something called, we take the global context of the Bible. What we do is we take something called the global context of the Bible. When I read a particular passage, I do not take my entire theology out of just that passage. So I look around the scripture and look at what all God has to say about the same thing. And taking all those verses in the context of the Bible, the historical context of the Bible, who is writing the letter, to whom is it being written, what is the nature of the text, and that's how I reach theology. So when we take a, 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 a verse like, anyone who calls onto the name of the Lord will be saved, yes and no. Yes, all those who are saved will be those men and women who called out to the name of the Lord. But there can be an unbelieving calling out to the name of the Lord as well. So, if the verse was more explicitly uh, yeah. mentioned, we could have gone to the... Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think one helpful resource, I, I, I uh, borrow this from John Piper, whom you saw in the... Uh, he says something very interesting. He says, we must not assume when we see a word in a place in scripture and we know that word has been used in other places in scripture that it always means the exact same thing 
in our language we don't have that so he was talking about i forget the examples i think it's the word set in english has over 300 definitions in the in the dictionary uh, uh, the word rock uh, has different meanings that it conveys when you say hard as a rock or, or, or rock and you know so uh, rock music is different from a rock and so it's the same word in two different positions but it means different things you have a verse that says anyone who calls upon the name of the lord shall be saved but you also have a verse that says not everyone who calls upon me lord lord have we not done this will be saved because uh, i will tell them i never knew you so there is an all in the sense of those who call so i can use that words in a context to say if your calling is genuine if i have a pretext to that where i say if you genuinely call upon the lord any one of you who call upon the name of the lord shall be saved right and i'm still using the same words you 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 pick that out you can use it multiple ways so th- that's what he was talking about global context the bible is the word of god it is scripture alone as the foundation of all christian faith and practice because it is sufficient inerrant that is it has no errors and it is fully capable of leading us and profiting us in correction reproof righteousness all of it but here's the thing the book of james is not sufficient the book of paul is not su- the books of paul the letters of paul is not sufficient the gospel of matthew is not sufficient the scripture the 66 books of scripture is sufficient you can't have james without the letters of paul you can't have the letters of paul without the gospel statements and the reason it is sufficient is our theology is informed not by individual verses but how they rest upon the context within which they are proclaimed and the global context of the bible so that would be one way i think we're we're out of time no one